Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll be in verses 15 through 20 today. I'm going to read that and uh, thank you, brother. Appreciate it. I'm going to read that together, then we'll break it down and Today is also what's known as Pentecost Sunday around the world. Christians are celebrating the day that the Holy Spirit came. Yes, praise God. Amen. And we celebrate or we remember it, but the reality is is the Holy Spirit is still here and moving just as mighty as he did in Acts chapter 2. And we we are spirit-filled church. We believe in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And so uh, we're going to dive a little bit into that today, but we are working on our Holy Spirit series coming up. And so we're looking forward to breaking down more of our helper, our comforter, also known as the Holy Spirit. So Ephesians chapter five, we prayed for our word today. We are ready. You guys ready? Man, you guys, wow, powerful time of worship. I just thank God for this worship team. I thank God for you coming in worshiping. Thank you. Just a side note, you know, as we worship and and go after God throughout the week, it's just going to be extra here, you know. It's going to be overflow here. And so I just want to encourage you to keep doing that throughout the week. You know, make it a habit to be in prayer, reading the word, and worshiping God. And when we come here, it's just going to be, wow, it's going to be fire in here. Right, it's going to be the Holy Spirit moving and working. So, thank God for that. Ephesians chapter five. We're in a small paragraph today, but you know, Pastor Ryan, he's going to make it stretch. And if if I can, let me read verse fourteen to give us a little context. It says, "For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light.'" So be careful, verse 15, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul moves from a contrast of light and darkness to a, he's adding on to that, a contrast of wise and foolish. And so it's interesting, he's not necessarily getting rid of the idea of light versus darkness, he's just adding that those who live in the light need to be wise. Those who live in the dark are fools because they don't understand what's going on in the spiritual and they're lost in their sin. Remember in Ephesians 4, they have darkened minds. They're hopelessly confused. It's not an insult. When he says they're fools, he's not insulting them. He's saying they're in their foolish ways. But we as believers are called to be wise. And there's actually four areas where he is trying to help us see that. And it starts in verse 15. He says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Well, here's the four ways to live wisely in the next few verses. Care how you live. Right there in verse 15, he said, be careful how you live. Number two, make the most of every opportunity. So wise, the wise make the most of every opportunity. Third one, he's going to show us that we understand the will of the Lord. When you are wise, you understand the will of the Lord. You want to know and understand his will for your life. And lastly, a wise person who lives in the light, a believer, a child of God, is filled with the Holy Spirit. How cool is that? On the day of Pentecost, this is our scripture. Isn't that neat? I love that. So Ephesians 5, 15 through 20 Again, verse 16, he says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. And a lot of these verses connect. So so even verse 15, 16, 17, they're really 
meant to be read together, even verse 14. And I love what Warren Wearsby says about, and I'm going to show you this in verse 15 again, and then we'll go back to 16. But Warren Wearsby said this, don't walk in your sleep. Wake up. Okay, so he's, he's connecting verse 14 with verse 15. He says, open your eyes, make the most of the day. And he goes on to say this, it is sad to see many professed Christians drift through life like sleepwalkers who never really make the most of opportunities to live for Christ and serve him. And that hurts a little bit, you know? And sometimes I've been there, I went through my week and I realized on the other end of the week, I missed a couple opportunities to be a witness for God. I'm Pastor Ryan, I'm not perfect. I'm lining up in that, the imperfect line. There are times where I have realized later on, ah, oh, that, was, that was an opportunity from God. But you know what? I was, I was distracted. I was stressed. I was tired. I was busy. And I missed in the spirit what God was wanting to do. And, and Warren Wearsby saying, don't, don't drift through life just doing, just doing whatever your, the, the base amount, you know, that little bit. Let's do what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Let's not sleepwalk through life. Let's not be on autopilot through life. I love that. In other words, be careful how you live. That's what he says right here. Think about it. Be intentional in how you live. There's a lot of practical lessons in our scripture today. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Walking in wisdom means making the best possible use of all circumstances. Make the best possible use of all circumstances. I got to tell you, I've been a, a Christian my entire life pretty much since I was five. And more conscientious about it, obviously, when I was around 12 or so. But I got to tell you, uh, circumstances are not perfect. When you go to serve God, they're not always like, and by the way, the door isn't wide open and a spotlight shines on it and says, that's the way you go. It's not always like that. Just going to let you know that. Christians are in this world, but we're not of it. So when we look at our days, we're supposed to look at them differently than the way the world does. Again, in Ephesians 4, 17 through 19, people, they are in their darkened minds. I'm sorry, it might be chapter 5. But they're in their darkened minds. They're hopelessly confused. They're lost in their dark ways. But we as Christians, we're not. We've been lit up by the Holy Spirit. We have spiritual eyes to see things. We're in this world, but we're not of it. We're supposed to look at the days differently and do something with it is what he's saying here. Paul isn't saying, you ready for this, parents? Kids, you're going to like this. Paul isn't saying, get your chores done. This is a great day to get your chores done. That's not it. I had a list of chores for my kids yesterday. I made a really long list. It was absurd. Because I wanted to go to the park and do like a picnic, go for a walk, see the new bridge at Killen's Pond. And they're like, no, I don't want to do that. So I made a long list of chores. Next thing you know, they get their bags, they're getting their shoes on, we're packing the car. It worked, because I definitely didn't want to, I was like, please, Lord, let them pick the park, please, because that list is absurd. It's ridiculously long. Well, you know, the context of this scripture isn't about everyday life. It's really about the mission of God. Remember, our last paragraph was about shining the light of Christ in our dark world. The last, last week. This week it carries on. He's not saying, hey, you know, make the most of your, get all your work done. I mean, that's a good, that is a good thing to do. Get your chores done so you can be free to what? To minister to someone then. Not to be necessarily lazy through life or never doing work for the Lord. I mean, Paul is the last and the least lazy person you will ever meet in scripture. Just so you know. And he's calling the church to make the most of those three hours you have left to do something good with it. And that's what we do. And do we rest? Yes. The Bible talks about rest, the Sabbath, and taking a day to rest. Should we have leisure time? Yes. All of that. 
but there's still things to be done for the Lord. And that's the context that Paul is talking about. You know what he's saying here? Christians must seize every chance to turn others from darkness to light. People are living in the dark. I showed you last week that light around me. There's people outside of us that need to be pulled into the light or the light goes where they are. I love that. We don't have to wait for people to come to us. We can take the light with us wherever they are. Hey, can I say something real quick too? And this is no um, condemnation on us, but a lot of times we'll try to get people to come to church. And I think you should. I think you should invite people to come to church with you. But just so you know, when you invited them, you just brought church to them because you're the church. Let's not limit God to just bringing people to church. Let's take God to people. Amen? That was a little commercial break. A little commercial break because we are the light of the world. So we can do that. That's what makes the church so powerful. I don't have to break down these walls, go to some neighborhood, put them back up, get the worship team to come to my neighborhood, and then we do church. That's a worship service for Christians. I get to bring the light of Christ to my neighbors every single day. There's plenty of opportunity. All right, look at this fascinating scripture from Ecclesiastes 11.4. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. Bottom line, you're never gonna have perfect circumstances. The conditions to live for God will never be perfect. In fact, he says, we're in evil days, so make the most of it. Now, can you imagine if Paul was here today, what he would think? Wow, talk about evil. It was bad then too. I mean, Ephesus was godless. At least in America, we have Christians. In Ephesus, there was no church until he came in the scene and spread the gospel. And this little church started growing and growing and growing and growing. So it was godless then in their perspective. Today, there's a lot of evil going on in our world. And guess what? You can't wait for perfect conditions to be the light. Be wise and use your opportunity. I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna say a couple honest things because that's what I do as a pastor. We gotta be real, right? And I love our church. I love what God wants to do in my life. I appreciate once, once he, what he wants to do in my life. But there's a couple of things that God put on my heart to say this week. And trust me, I'm not saying this to hurt anyone. I'm saying this because God struck me first. Unfortunately, there are fears distractions and time wasters that are stopping us, not just evil opposition. In other words, the devil's probably sitting back going, oh, they're already distracted. I don't even need to bother with them. That hit me hard when I was studying this week and praying. What's interesting is, is in the first church, when the Holy Spirit fell on them, they all of a sudden went from hiding in a room praying to being bold on the streets proclaiming the word of the Lord and sharing their faith. When, when the Holy Spirit fills you, fear leaves. When the Holy Spirit fills you, priorities get straight. When the Holy Spirit fills you, you see what God sees and you care about what God cares about. Wow. There's at least one person in your life that God has brought for you to share the gospel to. I mean, we can go to people, but sometimes we're not seeing that God has already brought someone to your doorstep. And that's at least one person that you can pour into. Just one. What do I mean? Be a disciple maker. Teach and guide them on how to believe and follow Jesus. Answer questions that they have. Pray for them. When they say that they're sick, pray for a healing and a miracle. When they say they need help with finances or they need help watching a kid, offer your help to, to do that. Whatever it is, we can be that light. We should take that opportunity to go, oh, this is it. This is my chance to show the love of Christ. That's what he's saying here. And here's the other strong part. Hold on, let me get some water before I do this. Um, I think that there's 
things in our lives that we should be passionate about and really care about. And we should fight for things here in America too. And we should, we should stand for what we believe in as Christians. We should. And at the same time, I think it grieves God's heart if we line up for those causes but don't line up to be his witnesses. And that hit me hard this week. Like he, he's, he's called us to be a witness of what he is. In other words, your life is a testimony of God's power. Your testimony, people don't even know yet. Your neighbors may not know your test. Your coworkers may not know your testimony yet. But they may know that you're lining up for a cause here on earth. But what about the, earth, what about the, the heavenly cause? The eternal cause? And when God hit me this week, it was like he said, I need you to say that in love. That do both. Do both, but make sure God and his mission is priority in your life. Make sure that you are spending time helping someone believe and follow Jesus. Make sure you're serving the church and serving in the community. We, the church, serve in our community. We, the church, are impacting our community. Serve with us. Get in line to help us reach Delaware and beyond. Because why? The days are evil. And earthly causes can only go so far. And then there's the heavenly cause, the mission of God, where those people could go to hell if they don't know Jesus. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. So praise God for that word. And we take that uh, with, with the humility that's needed. But thankfully, we can defend what we need to defend here for people's rights and for people's, you know, there, there is, there's a lot of evil going on. There's a lot. And we need warriors in the spirit for God that are willing to defend the truth. And so please do, please do. Verse 17, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Tyndale commentary, I think, really says something amazing about what is the Lord's, what does he want us to do? And it says this, the most vital thing to be understood is what the will of the Lord is. Such knowledge is to be sought more than any other knowledge. My dad, Christian his whole life, pastor for over 40 years, and yet his main book is the Bible. Because the Lord's will is more important than any other knowledge out there. How do we understand the Lord's will? Good question. How do we understand the Lord's will? We discern God's general will for all of us in Scripture. For instance... He doesn't want anyone to perish, but to have everlasting life. That's his general will. Or love others, and as you love others, you're fulfilling the law of Christ. And you're also loving God. That's his general will. But what about specific for every single person? Okay, this is interesting. We discern God's specific will for us through scripture, community counsel or wisdom, prayer, through circumstances and direction from the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example. I'm called to love God, love others, help people go to heaven, but God specifically called me to be a full-time pastor. How did I figure that out? The more I was hanging out with God and reading his word, and the more the Holy Spirit led me, I found a hunger to preach the word of God and to serve the church and to reach the lost right here in Dover, Delaware, did I know if I was going to be back here after college? No. God opened the door for me to come back to my hometown to be here, and I thank God for that. But that was my specific journey with God. But guess what never changes the whole time? Love God. Love others. Help people go to heaven. Make heaven crowded. 
That's all of our will. That's, that's, God wants you to do that. He wants us to be disciple makers who make disciples of Christ, followers of Christ. So how do we do that? So ready for this? We discern God's will through scripture, but I love what Warren Wiersbe goes. He goes a little further. He says, too many Christians have the idea that discovering God's will is a mystical experience that rules out clear thinking. But this idea is wrong and dangerous because here's why. Sometimes we can have this mystical feeling that I'm supposed to go do this, but it's not based in scripture either. So he goes on to say this, we discover the will of God as he transforms the mind, Romans 12, one through two. As his word transforms our mind, and here's what he says, the, re- the transformation is a result of the word of God, prayer, meditation, and worship. Meditation meaning prayer, contemplating what God's trying to say, listening to the Holy Spirit. Learning his will involves gathering these facts, examining them, weighing them, and praying for his wisdom on what to do next. So when I was trying to figure out what God's specific will is for my life, I went through that kind of process. I was reading the word. And as I read the word, God was shaping my heart to care about what he cared about. And then I went to my mom and dad. And I told them what I was feeling, what I felt like the Holy Spirit was trying to say to go into full-time ministry. We prayed. They gave me counsel. And then through circumstances, I started to watch how God was using me in those ways. And that's how I figured out my specific will for my life. God's will, not my will, God's will for my life. The more we know God's word, the more we know his heart and the clearer our direction will be. The more we know his word, the more we know his heart and the clearer your direction will be. You get used to God's voice. You get used to understanding the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying this because, okay, you're, you, maybe you're going, well, Ryan, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of done. I know what I did. I'm, get, I'm, I'm leaning into retirement here, right? So I, what's God's will for me now? Well, it's not always around careers. It's actually around something more important. It's around saving souls. And so what's going to happen is God's not done with you yet. You retiring as a teacher or a judge or a coach, praise God. Way to go. Way to do it to honor God. And God's like, all right, guess what I got for you now? Some other stuff to do. And, and, and he does that even while you're working, right? Your workplace is a harvest field. So thank God for that. And then he goes into something you just don't see coming. Don't be drunk with wine. Just out of nowhere. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I took some time to really ponder on this. Like, why did Paul go down that route? Maybe in this church or in this community, people were getting drunk. And he's like, don't go back to that. Remember, you're in the light. Be wise. And I thought about this too. Thoughts, words, and actions become ineffective and even destructive when drunk. And yet the previous three verses all said to be careful how you live, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days, and understand the Lord's will. All three of those would be impaired if we're drunk. All three of those would be hard to figure out when you're drunk. In other words, don't be drunk because you need to stay alert because the days are evil, careful how you live, make the most of every opportunity. Don't act or think thoughtlessly. You know, that that can happen when you're drunk. No, you don't want to be like that. You want to understand what the Lord's will is. That's why he's saying that. And the alternative is so much better than what too much wine can bring. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always with you wherever you go. And he fulfills more than any substance on this planet. So let me explain what this is trying to say. Because be filled is a command. 
That's actually a command. It's in the plural form in the Greek. Be filled with the Holy Spirit is for all the church. The whole church is commanded to be filled. Now, the interesting thing here is, is that we're already given the Holy Spirit at salvation. Romans 8 teaches us that. Ephesians 1 through 13 teaches us that. But the church in Ephesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you can read about that in Acts chapter 19, 1 through 7. After salvation, the Holy Spirit came upon them, like in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit came upon them and baptized them with fire and power to be witnesses. You know what came with that Holy Spirit? Courage, boldness, and Ephesus grew. Ephesus grew because they became witnesses. So the, the letter he's writing to this church, they've already been given the Holy Spirit through salvation. They've already been filled with the Holy Spirit. So why is he saying be filled? Because the Greek actually is trying to say keep being filled. Stay full of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what would obstruct with that? Being full of wine. Being drunk on wine would obstruct and impair you from being full. That when the world chooses to do a bunch of sin, the Holy Spirit is left out. And he wants us to be full. He wants us to keep being full. And there's also a passive uh, structure to this Greek. It was a, this was a deep verse as I was breaking this down. There is a passive structure to this verse in the Greek that says, be open let the Holy Spirit fill you. So live a life full of the Holy Spirit and stay open to him constantly filling you, which means don't fill your life with something that would stop that from happening. Let's not even just focus on wine and drinking too much of it. Let's focus on anything. Anything could fill your life more than that and be an instruction to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. So... Wow. How do we be filled and keep being filled with the Holy Spirit? How do we do that? I think that's an important question. And I don't want to leave here without trying to address that. One of the things we have to have is an understanding that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. That God actually wants to fill you. That you're worthy of having his presence in your life. Isn't that amazing? You may not feel like you deserve any of God's presence in your life. But when he came in and saved you, he cleansed you from the inside out. Now, we've been reading in the scripture that we should also keep our lives in the light and pure. So, yes, there may be some sweeping and cleaning that needs to take place. Make room. Right? But what happens is we need to have a hunger for God, an expectancy that he wants to fill us. And we're called to seek, continually seek the Holy Spirit. Church, I cannot do this without the Holy Spirit. I can't be a dad without the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen from any parents in here? But it's hard to be hungry for more of God when we're full of this world. So Paul is warning the church, do not be full of this world. So that way you're hungry for more of the Holy Spirit. I love that. There's a more. You got the Holy Spirit at salvation, but on Acts 2, at Pentecost, God said there's more. And there's more. And there's more. And there's more. Ask. When the church was... I'm going to, because of time, I won't be able to break down Acts 2 right now, but we'll get to it in our series. But what happened was Jesus commanded the disciples and his followers, women too, followers, all of them, to wait for him in Jerusalem, to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. So they obeyed. They did the Lord's will. What, what is the Lord's will? What should I do today? Whatever God wants you to do today. Well, at that day, Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait. Wait. They were expecting. They were hungry for whatever Jesus promised. They were hunger. They had the hunger and they were hungry for more that Jesus promised. 
and expectancy, seeking the Holy Spirit, okay? We can ask for the Holy Spirit. But when they were there, they were praising God and they were waiting on God's timing. They were praying together, all together. And then out of nowhere, the Holy Spirit showed up 50 days later after the resurrection. After the resurrection. And that day is known as Pentecost. And so they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they changed. I mean, they're... Peter changed. Peter was a guy that denied Jesus three times. Now everyone's like, you know what's really interesting? When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were praying in different languages and people heard them and thought they were drunk. What a cool correlation to our scripture today. Some people say they were drunk in the spirit. I don't really like to use that phrase. They were full. They were baptized. They were overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And people were like, and Peter's like, it's only nine in the morning, come on. Peter comes out and he preaches the gospel because of this opportunity. They were careful how they should live. They sought what the Lord's will was and did it. And they seized the opportunity. This church was living what Paul was gonna say later. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And 3,000 people gave their life to Christ that day on Pentecost, not including women and children. And Peter was a guy who was hiding beforehand. And now he's that bold. What am I trying to say? What comes with the Holy Spirit is what we need right now. And what we need right now is is to not have a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. 2 Timothy 1 says, 1 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self control. That's what you get with the Holy Spirit. Why wouldn't you want more of that? I know I do. Man, these, the opposite of these weakness, anger, or hate, a lack of self control. Man, I don't want that in my life. I want the Holy Spirit. And this is what comes with it too. This is John 14, 26. This is the promise Jesus gave to the church. The helper or comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, the Holy Spirit. That's, you get all of that. That sounds good. The last time I checked, being drunk on wine, or eating a bunch of junk food, or watching a bunch of trash on TV didn't give you any of that. It gave you remorse, regret, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Wow, in my place, whom the Father will send in my name in my place to represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you all things and he will help you remember everything that I have told you. Wow. I want the Holy Spirit. I have a hunger for the Holy Spirit. And lastly, he, well, I better make sure I put this up there. We are vessels that God can be full of this world or full of, I'm sorry, we are vessels that can be full of this world or full of God. And God wants to pour his spirit into us, but we have to hunger and want him. I know I've said that a few times, but let it be said again. He finishes with this, and we're going to sing together in a moment, and then Dorothy will come out, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the psalms of the Old Testament. They would pull those out, and they would sing them. They didn't rhyme. They just sang them. What's interesting is, is pagans used hymns to actually sing to their gods. What the Christians did was they created their own songs to sing about the life of Christ and the doctrines of the church. That's what they did. So they, they stole a pagan practice and made it good. They redeemed it. They're redeeming the music of God. And spiritual songs can be songs that just come from your heart. I don't know, some of you sing like that during Sunday. You don't have to be weirded out when people start singing spiritual songs from their heart. That's, that's biblical right here. 
spiritual songs from your hearts. And then the overflow of the Holy Spirit is not just songs, not just hymns, spiritual songs, but it's thanksgiving for God. A thankful heart. Something happens when we come together and worship. I want to close with this. And we're going to sing a song together. We're going to declare truths together as a church. But something happens. Corporate worship is a powerful moment together. Corporate being all of us together. Because as we worship and declare the name of Christ, the character, wonders, and power of God, we are first and foremost glorifying God in our lives. We also affirm and reinforce these truths to one another as we hear each other singing. We need to hear each other say these truths. We need the body of Christ to sing and speak praises to God. It edifies and builds us up. We hear a lot of garbage that tears us down all week, and sometimes it's directed right at us, isn't it? But when we come together and we praise God and we sing these truths, it's a praise that some of us need to hear. That's the power of corporate worship. That's the power of coming together and singing out of the overflow of the Holy Spirit in your life all week, not just waiting until Sunday, but living full of the Holy Spirit, which is completely given to you if you want it. If you want him, the Holy Spirit, he will fill you and you keep seeking him and you, and you remove things from your life that are in the way. He will show you. He's like, I need that to go because I can't have fellowship with that. And when you make room, he will come in and fill you and you will just be overflowing with thanksgiving and songs for God. And when you come in, I'm telling you right now, when I hear you guys sing and I hear you sing these words today, it's going to speak volumes to my life and my spirit too. We need to hear each other sing. We need to hear the praises of God because we're hearing a bunch of other garbage in our world. Amen. So let's pray and we're going to sing. God, would you fill us today? Fill us this week. Fill us in our alone time. We need more of you. God, I pray you would help us to be careful how we live. Make the most of every opportunity. Not to act thoughtlessly, but to know your will. Help us to know it, Lord. We're going to get in our word and know your will. And live it out. God, we want we don't want a spirit of fear. We want a spirit of power, love, and self-control. We want the comforter, the healer, the advocate. So God, come and fill us in this room now. And even when we're out, refill us again. We thank you that your spirit is with us as believers. And we want more. We declare this song, this modern hymn to you. We declare it together as a body in unity to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.